I'm here today with uh, Jeffrey Miller. Jeffrey Miller is an evolutionary psychologist who got a BA from Columbia University and a PhD from Stanford, and is a tenured professor at the University of New Mexico. His works include The Mating Mind, Mating Intelligence, and Mate, Becoming the Man Women Want. He's also a familiar to Rebel Wisdom, as he was in a documentary that was about um, the polyamorous professors, which featured him and his wife, who's also uh, an evolutionary psychologist. Her name is Diana Fleischman. So thanks, Jeffrey, for being here today. Super excited. Pleasure to, to be here. Questions. Thank you all for showing up also. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, I mean, sex. Sex is like such a salient topic, such a critical part of how we live as human beings, as evolved creatures. And yet I feel like most of the implications of sexual selection and the evolutionary perspective has not been integrated into the way that we understand sex generally within the culture. And so I'm very excited to kind of talk to you about what are the implications of being sexually evolved creatures for how we live politically, how we live socially, how we engage in our societies and, and our, our relationships. And I think one of the ways that you started your conversation with, um, with David in the documentary you did was talking about how mating systems are, are upstream of, of political and social and cultural systems. Could you talk a little bit about what you mean when you, when you frame it like that? Yeah, thanks, Raven. This, this is my favorite topic, you know, the intersection of um, sex and human nature and psychology and, um, but also kind of current political and ideological topics, I think are heavily influenced by people's sort of intuitive models of human sexuality. And, um, we, you know, we know from political psychology, particularly evolutionary political psychology, that a lot of people's attitudes about political topics that don't really seem to have to do with sex directly are actually pretty heavily predicted by their attitudes towards things like um, sexual exclusive monogamy versus casual sex. You know, that in like, if you basically, if you're against casual sex, you tend to be uh, more religious, more anti-drug legalization, um, uh, more conservative generally. And one of my goals is to kind of break apart a little bit that extremely strong correlation between our sort of intuitive understandings of human sexuality and our sort of patchwork of political beliefs. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of those correlations need to be kind of unpacked and, and interrogated a little bit more so we can have a more sophisticated grown up adult conversation about these topics. So partially there's like tension between those two different mating systems. If you have a, like a heterogeneous group and you have some people in the group who are casually dating each other and you have some people who are strict monogamists and, you know, two like a Romeo and Juliet, two people fall in love with each other who don't exist within the same kind of mating system that actually causes a lot of emotional conflict between people in the group. So you could, you could see how there would be, lines kind of drawn, boundaries drawn about mating systems in order to reduce conflict within groups. And then maybe that also ends up evolving into different kind of social and cultural beliefs. Is that kind of the, the idea that you're talking about there? Yeah, I kind of strayed away from your first question, but the mating systems are absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know from behavior genetics that there are stable individual differences in terms of kind of mating strategies, like to what extent you kind of form long-term sexually exclusive kind of jealous pair bonds versus you have a slightly broader palette of um, kind of using sex to make friends, basically. And that <laughs> could include polyamory. It could include bisexuality. You know, it could include various kinds of homosexuality even. And because competition over mates is absolutely central to kind of all status competition and resource competition within a tribe ancestrally, you know, trying to police other people's sexual behavior is a, is a very powerful way to get a competitive advantage of some sort. And also trying to kind of legislate, you know, I want my mating strategy to be the default, the norm for everybody is also a way to give yourself competitive advantages and to kind of marginalize all the other mating strategies. 
and we see this again and again throughout history that what looks like you know a political or religious or ideological debate kind of boils down to um, an argument between people who, who are pursuing fundamentally different kinds of mating strategies that are kind of part of the, their core nature. Mm -hmm. For a long time, though, it seems like, especially like kind of the particular trajectory of Western civilization, monogamy has been both a kind of left and a right like norm. It's been a general norm in society. But then once we had the intervention of contraception in our world, that totally upended the necessity for monogamy um, as, as part of how we reduce the cost, the burden of pregnancy on women. So how does contraception fit into this? What kind of world are we in now that we have this very cheap, easily distributed ability um, to basically remove this asymmetrical cost on women who are engaging in, in sexual activity. I mean, that I feel like for that is just like a major shift that we don't really have any historical precedent for. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems just like totally different than any kind of situation that other human beings have inherited in the past. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is a major shift in, in one way, but it doesn't really overturn all of the kind of evolutionary or traditional rationales for monogamy. So, you know, what problems did long-term pair bonds solve? Number one, <coughs> it solved the problem of um, fraternity certainty. Sorry, the uh, pollen count here in Austin, Texas is pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> Paternity certainty. So do guys know that the baby is actually theirs? So sexual jealousy is one way of solving that. Forming long-term pair bonds is another way. Getting everybody else to help you police who your mate is hanging out with, i.e. socially enforced monogamy, where there's, there's punishments for cheating. And that's a kind of paternity certainty uh, superpower. Mm -hmm. In terms of contraception, you know, hunter-gatherer women for thousands of years have used various strategies to kind of control their, um, their birth rate. And, you know, they've tried to use abortifacient drugs of various sorts with varying, you know, effectiveness. They've sometimes engaged in infanticide if the conditions are bad for raising a kid. But the, the cheapness and effectiveness and widespread availability of contraception ever since the pill in the early 60s is unprecedented. So, you know, the the problem of taking control of your fertility if you're a woman, being confident about whose kids are yours if you're a man, these were two major reasons for forming long-term pair bonds that are no longer quite as relevant in modern society. On the other hand, you know, mammalian sex differences 101 says the key difference between males and females is uh, pregnancy. And that is still very dimorphic. So basically, you know, if males could get pregnant and couldn't get other people pregnant, they would act exactly like females do. If females could get other people pregnant and couldn't get pregnant themselves, they would act exactly like males do. That's the evolutionary perspective on sex differences. And that is still a kind of um, uh, bedrock truth of, of human mating, uh, you know, at least until we get like artificial wombs and all kinds of new systems of reproduction that raise all kinds of other bioethical issues. Well, I think what that also brings up is this like fundamental asymmetry between fe males and females, men and women, which obviously our interests, male and female interests are aligned in some ways and not aligned in others. And that creates a really complex environment for the negotiation of of cooperation between between men and women, and I feel like there's a there's a lot of resentment um, 
by the sexes towards the opposite sex right now in our kind of cultural environment. And, you know, obviously there's a high salience to that signal and maybe that gets boosted by social media and just the incentives about online communication. But there also seems to be this underlying possibility of resentment within the sexes because of these fundamental asymmetries. Can you talk a little bit about like the sex differences and how that kind of, that creates these both conflicting and cooperative needs between, between the sexes? Yeah, the battle of the sexes is usually portrayed as sort of a zero sum game. And that's, you know, deeply misleading from an evolutionary viewpoint, because obviously, you know, to make a new generation, you need males and females to cooperate at least to some degree to produce offspring. Now, the backstory, though, is for most of the 4000 species of mammals, females really have very little to do with, with males, apart from in sort of the breeding season. They're not friends. They don't really hang out together. You know, local alpha males kind of dominate groups of females in a territory and exclude other males. But I don't imagine that like female deers or horses or uh, other mammals have any particular affection or compassion for the males or, or vice versa. Humans are really unusual because we're one of the few um, <clears throat> mammals, along with prosimians, who actually form long-term pair bonds um, at all. It's pretty pretty rare in, in primates to do that. So we have, I think, a bunch of recent evolutionary hacks in the last few million years that make it possible for us to kind of cohabit and be friendly and, and recognize more of a positive sum interaction. You know, it's complicated. This is one of the key zones of, of um, sexual conflict. And uh, my friend David Buss here down the road at University of Texas, Austin, has a new book out about sexual conflict. Oh. And he's been studying this stuff for 30 years. Uh, might be fun for you guys to interview at some point. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, all the way from economic conflicts of interest to paternity uncertainty to do we share the same bedroom or get separate bedrooms, even if we're living together um, to what do we watch on TV? There's, there's so much opportunity for, you know, sex differences and interests and values to manifest themselves as conflict in relationships. Yeah. It's, it seems like there's also this idea, this kind of ideological appeal to equality that seems to be giving us, um, very strange intuitions about how to resolve the tension between the sexes. And there's kinds of strategies of interaction in the world that women um, are able to use to be successful socially. And there's some that men are able to use to be successful socially. And those strategies are not easily used by the opposite sex. And I feel like that causes in this, in this world where we're so interested in social status and we're in the same hierarchies, like men and women have been brought into the same hierarchies. They're competing for the same kinds of status and success. And yet men and women have different kinds of things. Obviously like beauty is one of these things that women can just accelerate themselves um, to, to a degree that just men just fundamentally cannot because of their, their, I mean, evolved, characteristics and how we're so like, you know, uh, just absolutely caught in the beauty of a person. I mean, that's going to have an effect on the way that women can move in society and the way that men can't. And I guess to me, that seems like a place where resentment can arise. And it brings about a question to me about the, the kind of framing of equality itself. Like, how do we understand conceptually the differences of, between the sexes while maintaining an idea of their their moral worth or something as being equal, but their characteristics and the potential ways of playing social games are actually divergent in many ways? Yeah, the issue of equality is, you know, the standard way of talking about it is, oh, there's sex differences, but we still have to respect uh, sort of equality as a political ideal, as a human rights ideal. But I think there's a third sense of equality that's underappreciated, which is what I call the genetic equality of the sexes. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is that, you know, if you think about the, the 20,000 genes and, you know, 23 pairs of chromosomes that are in your body that have been passed down through 
your mom and your dad and your grandparents of both sexes. You know, half of your genes come th down through females and half down through males, right? Apart from Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA. And what that means is in combination with the fact that you have genetic recombination happening all the time across all the chromosomes is almost by definition, the sexes are equal at the genetic level in terms of being equally good at being what they are. In other words, from an evolutionary genetic point of view, females are as good at being females as males are at being male on average. Mm -hmm. That's the way the genetics has to work. Mm -hmm. And I think if men and women understood that insight, it might help because it means whenever you find you know, a sex difference in any particular trait, there's a reason for the difference. There's a reason why there's different optima on mm -hmm. that trait because of selection, possibly, or maybe culture. And it, it kind of makes the idea that, oh, men are naturally evolutionarily superior to women or vice versa. It makes that nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, especially in the, the sexual environment in general, it seems like you know, there's lots of people who just aren't forming long-term relationships or even short-term relationships with anyone. There's like a rise in, you know, virginity for people under the age of, of 30. There's um, all sorts of ways that we've, we're kind of like at a distance from one another. I think one of the interesting things about sex to me is that it creates the necessity for two different kind of forms to come together in space and time. It creates a necessity for coordination. Um, and it seems like the coordination mechanisms that we've relied on as a kind of commons in our way of a way of interacting with with other members of the opposite sex have broken down and that you can see that symptomatically in how atomized everybody is and alienated and there's a sterility to that because when you are as only one of your kind of gametes you're you're not producing any kind of uh, new life or new kind of generation and it seems like we're kind of the anxiety that per pervades prevents this kind of connection or this reaching across into, into the world of the other and contacting them in a way that brings about um, a kind of awareness of how to even engage with someone of the opposite sex. So I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, your read kind of on the, the way that young people are interfacing with one another and, and the opposite sex and also this this phenomenon where people just aren't contacting one another and the coordination mechanisms that I mean we do have they seem to be very lowest common denominator very like almost like pathological in terms of how dating apps bring people together and the kind of incentives that are produced by that yeah I think you're you're you know insightful to say it's it's really a matter of kind of coordination mechanisms. And like I worked in a game theory center at University College London for four years in the late 90s and learned all about coordination games. The simplest one is, do you drive on the right or drive on the left, you know, on, on roads with cars? And if everybody drives on the right, everybody's happy. If everyone drives on the left, you're happy. If you flip randomly and choose every time you take a trip, chaos. Yeah. So it's funny that our society is so good at developing coordination mechanisms for, you know, transmitting and accounting for value, like the economic systems and the free market and trading goods and services. And we have incredibly sophisticated coordination mechanisms for dealing with like material goods and services in the economy. But when it comes to the mating market, our coordination mechanisms suck they're just terrible like the dating apps don't actually work very well even if one gets pretty good for a while like i, I was a big fan of ok cupid you know five yeah. or seven years ago when it it seemed like all the cool interesting people were on there mm -hmm. and when it did a pretty good job of asking you know hundreds of questions about your interests and values and preferences and it actually matched you up really really well even after I started dating my wife, Diana, um, you know, we were like, I wonder how well we matched on OK Cupid. 99% we did. So, yay. <laughs> and 
but then OK Cupid went super political and basically expunged everybody other than far lefties from being able to use it. And so we, in terms of finding a mate, there's a coordination mechanism failure. How do you do that? You know, it used to be you could rely on the gossip network among your, your parents' generation, and they would kind of steer you towards, oh, you should meet that boy or girl in the other village. I've heard good things about them. Or now, what do you do? You go to a bar, you go to a rave, you go to Burning Man, you get on a dating app, whatever. It's We're kind of spoiled for choice, but we're also not very good at finding people who are actually like-minded. And then once you form a relationship, there's a bunch of coordination mechanisms, you know, that formerly went by the name of uh, sex roles. Mm. They were basically like, we could argue about who does what, but let's just kind of break those symmetries arbitrarily one direction or another. And like, maybe the male should do this and the female should typically do that. And those could be experienced as very constraining. But also when those, when those gender roles existed, they kind of cut down a lot on a lot of arguments and negotiations that now, you know, a lot of couples have to kind of relitigate almost every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which just adds a lot of, I guess, transaction cost. You're just constantly having to invest in, in the system of coordination for your day-to-day -day life. And that just is exhausting. And yet it does seem like there has been a fundamental change in how we work. And because of that, that necessitates a kind of re-examination of roles and I think that, I mean, I think you're right to point out the, the problem with blank slateism because it creates this, um, the intuitions about male and female roles, like they aren't grounded in some sort of like evolved nature of men and women and that there might be some reliable things that we could, that we could think about when we're thinking about the reexamination of, of sex roles, uh, even within the context of a new type of um, civilization where the, the labor of the mind is, is not going to depend on the physical strength of, of a body. You know, a woman can be pregnant and at home and doing data analysis. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that she's not as strong as a man. Um, and also that, that the kind of artificial boundaries in intellectual work have been broken. And so women and men are in the same office environments and they're working together in the same like worlds. And that I think, does naturally kind of create a space for questioning, well, who should be the one who's working more or who is the one who needs to go home and clean the toilet, you know, and how are we going to negotiate these roles? But it, it does seem like we're spinning our wheels on those questions because we're not grounding them in, in what natural kind of like, and totally, I mean, in a way, just very much mundane sex differences that men and women have, but it does, it does, the question of how women work together outside of sexual relationships in, in like work environments. And it does seem to have a relationship to the way we've evolved to be related to each other. Um, and also of course with me too, and all of these other types of social movements, there's like a, a change in the trust, I think, between men and women in our kind of public social environments. And it seems like there's going to have to be a lot of work, like cultural and social um, technology that we develop in order to uh, reestablish credibility between the sexes. How do you think about how we can repair some of the damage that's been, or I mean, damage, it's, it's more like a just novelty. It's just change. And we haven't really figured out how to adapt to it. Do you have ideas about how we can maybe negotiate um, the changes in the roles between the sexes? I do have a few ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I think one key thing is that I think each sex tends not to understand how the other sex does what's called intrasexual competition. So men don't really understand female versus female competition or how like female cliques or status hierarchies work. And I think women often don't understand really how male-male competition works. Um, at the scientific level, male-male competition is much better studied 
-hmm. and better understood because it tends to be more overt, violent, dramatic. It's easier to study in other species, et cetera. But I do have colleagues like Tanya Reynolds um, at University of New Mexico who's doing some really interesting work on female versus female competition. And why do women form the kinds of um, little micro teams and cliques that they do? On what basis do they compete for status? You know, how do they think about issues of loyalty and trust and, and, and betrayal in female friendships and so forth? And then how does that translate into the workplace? Mm -hmm. um, because what you get to some degree is like men have their own kind of status seeking uh, strategies and tactics and women have theirs and there's some overlap, but it can be extremely confusing if you're in a kind of dual sex workplace and each sex doesn't really understand the games that the other sex you know, are, are playing or even what the rules or the payoffs are. Mm -hmm. So I think a better conscious understanding of that could help. But of course, in modern corporate um, training or business schools, there's kind of a taboo about even talking about these differences. And so you then default either to sort of say, oh, well, like the traditional male way of doing it is normal and correct and valid, or defaulting to say, no, that's patriarchal bullshit. We should do this new female style way of, of doing it. And, and that makes everybody miserable, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it feels very bizarre that there's this re total rejection of what seems like a kind of very obvious reality of sex differences. Do you have like a, a take on why that is? Why are we re like, why is there this allergy? Why are we like sneezing out this like reality and refuse to kind of just acknowledge it and start to work from that fundamental place. And instead we reject. It's like everybody's reaction to the behavioral sciences is, is always asking in the back of their minds, how will this impact my political rights? Mm. And there's always the suspicion that if it sounds like you're saying anything, that's even two or three steps removed from someone attacking your, your, your political rights, people reject it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's based on a whole bunch of kind of historical stereotyping about, well, I think that view historically has tended to be associated with my political enemies or people who opposed whatever women in the workplace or abortion or secularism or whatever. And so I'm going to assume that, you know, oh, th this guy or this woman sounds like they might be adjacent to this other thing that's guilty by historical association, and therefore I will reject everything they say, all the evidence they bring to bear. And that's exceedingly dumb because it, it's a kind of ideological paranoia that assumes that everybody else is as politically motivated as the most vocal activists on Twitter. Mm -hmm. who, are, who are giving scientists grief about whatever they're, they're saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's like an insecurity about your like position within a political uh, war that you're, that you're saying is kind of like making all of these things feel like a tax rather than just the statement of some sort of like obvious fact of reality that, um, you know, if we weren't so politically agitated, we would all just be able to acknowledge I mean, that seems like also a kind of uh, underlying rivalrous dynamic between people who would probably naturally or maybe in a different kind of environment be cooperating with one another. So I, I think that there's a question here about pro-social development. And I, this does seem to be related to mating systems because there are certain mating systems where in order to win at the game, you have to develop cooperative behaviors. You have to learn how to uh, engage in courtship, or you have to move through the friction of your social environment in order to even get access to a mate. And then there are other kinds of social environments where there's no necessity for any type of development of, of social pro-social behavior whatsoever at all to be rewarded by sex. And it seems like in a, in a very dark kind of way, you know, dating apps are accelerating this, this, um, this process of, of not learning how to actually engage uh, and learn pro-social behaviors and that that could have really powerful political implications. 
because part of how we ingratiate ourselves into the adult world is learning how to uh, be very cooperative with with the opposite sex so that we can have relationships with them. So do you see like, what do you think about the kind of like the implications of more and more people engaging in sexual activity in this way that doesn't develop these pro-social behaviors? And will that have implications for other levels of how we organize ourselves as a society? Yeah, the, I mean, the weird thing is that we're such a hyper-social primate, you know, that, that evolved and, and tribes with many, many relationships, deep, continuing, you know, repeated interactions with other people, family members, friends, clan mates, whatever. And that one of the most attractive things that you can, you know, be sexually is high status, high prestige, high dominance. What does that mean? Those aren't really about your individual traits. Those are how your traits interact with the surrounding social context. If people pay attention to you, if they respect your knowledge, if they want to learn from you, if they think you're a good mentor, you have prestige, right? And that's attractive. If they defer to you, if they pay attention to what you're doing, that's status, right? And status is attractive. So the most sexually and romantically attractive traits that we have are these kinds of cooperative social mm -hmm. traits mm -hmm. or at least socially at least socially manipulative traits that don't rely on violence you know and and yet particularly i think with younger millennials and gen z i see a lot of people who are kind of socially handicapped in in all kinds of ways very simple example i've been teaching you know, college seminars for 30 years, you know, on and off. And I've noticed as the frequency of texting has increased, mm -hmm. people's just verbal, you know, articulateness and their, their comfort in talking in class has plummeted. Mm. And when I talk to young people, you know, in, in like my human sexuality classes about uh, dating and like, you know, you can text people, but you should try to go out and meet them like physically in person and talk with them. A lot of the Gen Zs are absolutely terrified at that prospect. Like they know how to text people, but they don't know how to talk to people. And language is pretty central to human courtship yeah. and mating. And if you're not, you know, verbally fluent, you're, you're pretty handicapped mm -hmm. in the mating market. Yeah, well, it's also has, yeah, I mean, the mediums of communication shifting, and I guess also just how so many more of us are spending a lot of our formative time online, and that's developing our kind of signaling and ideological systems and uh, also etiquette and how we think it we ought to be in terms of interacting with other people. I think that the other thing that seems to be happening as well is just the proliferation of extremely like frictionless pornography. Um, and the interesting thing ab about that is it seems to catch men in particular in this kind of like hypnotic state um, where they just can't stop consuming more increasingly intense uh, pornographic material. And it's just so impossible within the context of the internet to contain it. It's just, it just seems like this, this force that um, it just spreads so quickly. And women also obviously can gain a lot from producing thirst trap material um, that's very difficult to police. I mean, obviously, like uh, Instagram has rules around like nipple exposure, and yet you go on Instagram, it's just butts. You know, it's just butts everywhere. You know, So it's like, it's very difficult to get away from the image, the image of sex and its kind of power at... at uh, capturing our attention because of how salient sex has been for us as, as evolved creatures. What do you think about just the presence of the image um, of pornographic material in terms of distorting or impacting our ability to actually engage in sex in, in our kind of real actual bodies? I think there's quite a moral panic around porn at the moment that I don't think is empirically valid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been in the sex research uh, area for like 20 years, and I know a lot of the people who do the research on, on the porn. 
And there's an almost total split between the actual sex research experts who have looked at porn, mm. which largely has like either neutral or slightly positive or slightly negative effects, depending on your personality and how much you use it. You know, there's that world. And then there's the kind of alarmed guys in the manosphere, the no fat movement and the anti-porn movement and the sex addiction, porn addiction movement. Most of those guys are delusional and sociopathic and completely empirically, you know, unmoored from reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you'd asked back 50 years ago, okay, what would be the effect of sort of billions of men having unlimited 24 seven access to free online, high definition porn that catered to any conceivable taste, right? You might predict, oh, that would be absolutely catastrophic to mating. Mm -hmm. Nobody would ever bother to find girlfriends or, or ever have babies or do anything. Like you could have easily made that kind of dire prediction. And th that's been maybe at most 5% correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. Like, okay. Birth rates have dropped marriage ages are a little older. People are, you know, virginity rates are a little bit higher, but it's not the kind of global catastrophe that the, the anti-porn addicts are, are, are painting it as. Um, and also if you dig down into the data and you ask things like, okay, does violent porn make men more, you know, violent or more prone to rape or more prone to mistreat women? All the evidence I've seen says no. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable how strong the firewall is between watching porn and like real mating behavior. Mm -hmm. Just like there's a remarkably strong firewall between like guys playing super violent video games versus, you know, the actual rate of mass shootings in society is like a few dozen a year. Mm -hmm. Whereas the average young man has probably, you know, killed literally thousands of non-player characters in video games by the time they're 25. So basically less than one in a million males who played violent video games that involve mass shootings ever goes on to be a mass shooter. That's a remark. That's like remarkable testimony to the human ability to separate, you know, imagination from reality. Sure. And I mean, also the, you know, to, to try and make the argument that porn is causing lowering birth rates, is it's taking a leap, you know. Um, and just because there are people who end up with an addiction to porn, that doesn't mean that the general kind of person is going to have that probably problem. Just same, the same with other kinds of substance abuse or like substance addiction. It's like for some people, they smoke a cigarette and they don't have a problem. But for like a majority of people or for a different group of people, they will have substance abuse issues, no matter what you put in front of them. So I guess addiction, I mean, addiction is one of these, uh, another one of these big issues that, um, you know, uh, and sex is one of these things that can become, you know, an addictive fixation. Um, but, you know, I, I think the question of addiction more broadly hasn't really been discussed in a nuanced way in our, in our social environment. And maybe that's not really within the scope of conversation, but maybe sex addiction. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, al almost everything I would say about sex addiction, I would just borrow from my friend, David Lay, L-E-Y, who's written a wonderful book called The Myth of Sex Addiction. Uh -huh. um, and it's really good. And it kind of debunks this whole largely for-profit industry of sex addiction therapists. And, you know, the way that industry works is basically uh, wealthy middle-aged guys have affairs and their wives discover it and they say, oh, there's an affair. And the guy will go, oh, I'm a sex addict. Please yeah. let me go to therapy. It'll only cost $50,000 to sex addiction therapy, right? Please don't divorce me. And it's basically, um, it's like a, an anti-divorce protection racket. And so, you know, what, what is an addiction? Like almost every woman I've dated for the last 20 years has been a yoga addict Sure, yeah. in some sense, mm -hmm. right? They don't feel right unless they do yoga. 
every effing day. Mm-hmm. And it cuts into their time and it sometimes causes injuries. And, you know, it's a whole lifestyle cult from the point of view of non-yoga people. Mm-hmm. And if yoga was moralized, stigmatized, marginalized the way the porn is, you know, then we'd have a moral panic about mass yoga addiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay, so interesting. So, so I guess from, from your point of view then, what is, what, what is the greatest kind of underlying challenge that we have for creating a, a, an environment that is going to create a flourishing of, of families um, that have like this core kind of production of pro-social values and the continuation of that into the future? If it's not porn, if it's, you know, what do you think is kind of one of the core um, things that are cha- is challenging us in our society today? I think a lot of it has to do with um, the realities of work and kind of physical geography and housing policy and like where people live and where they can afford to live. We have this amazing moment right now post COVID where people got a little bit of taste of working from home and what it's like to actually spend time with a partner in the daytime, not just the evening Mm -hmm. and weekends and what it's like to cooperatively raise kids together at home, maybe do a little homeschooling, uh, maybe embark on some joint, um, you know, career projects with a spouse or, or girlfriend or boyfriend. And I think, um, you know, the government's complaining people aren't going back to work enough by government standards in terms of tax revenue. Uh-huh. But I think a lot of people are having a real rethink about how do we want to live? And here in Austin, Texas, where I'm kind of perching for the summer, there's this massive influx of people from New York and California, you know, very high housing cost areas where you can barely afford kind of a one bedroom apartment if you're a young couple to here where, well, used to be you could have a house now, maybe two bedroom apartment. Um, People are looking for different ways to live and different ways to be able to start a family a little bit earlier in life with less commuting stress, maybe with less um, less willingness to be pushed around and relocated by your corporate overlords. Mm. You know, I, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, as a basically a Procter and Gamble um, company town. Everybody in high school I went to high school with ended up working with Procter and Gamble if they didn't leave Cincinnati. And PNG, if you were middle management, would just shuffle you around city to city, like, okay, now you have to go spend three years abroad. Now you have to work at our San Francisco office, uproot your family, move it around. I don't know if people are willing to do that anymore. And so I think the intersection of like mating and parenting and housing is something I, I wish we could have that political discussion rather than talk about critical race theory or kind of all the stuff that is dominating conversation. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we highly, we adapt to environments and if, if like our shelter is not accommodating of families, it's going to be really hard. Like there's so much friction for producing a family. I mean, the cost is high. And I guess what you are also saying is there's this feeling of, if you have a child, you have to give them everything. You have to produce this like incredibly magical, perfect world that your child will be in and, um, you know, protect them from uh, whatever nefarious influences there are in society. And like that, that kind of puts a lot of pressure on young, young people in terms of like the ethics of parenting. Like, I think there's also this question too, because it feels like the default mode now is to not have a child that you have to actually have a reason to have a child. And there's also a suspicion of of biological urge or biological um, kind of qualities where it's like, well, not only do I need to have a a reason for having a child, it can't just be that I want one, you know, that my body wants me to have one because biology is somehow kind of nefarious and manipulative and it's, it's not my, you know, way of, 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 my true self is not my biological self. Um, What do you think about that kind of like cultural shift that now that there's this need to make a reason or to kind of 
create an elaborate argument, you know, like, like Brian Kaplan's book, <laughs> you know, in order to try and uh, convince people to have children. What is up with that? Well, it's hilarious to me that, you know, kind of evolved instincts that people consider politically illegitimate, like desire for kids or a desire to worship gods or a desire to be patriotic are kind of um, tarred with this, this super this derogation that those are kind of invalid. But then all the other social instincts that we have for status seeking or intellectual curiosity or social networking uh, or virtue signaling, right? Those are equally biological yeah. and have equally deep roots and adaptive functions, but they don't seem as politically problematic or maybe they don't challenge, you know, careerist. Um, capitalism in quite the same ways. So they're considered not even instincts. They're just like, well, obviously I want status and money. Like that's not instinctive, but you weirdos like Mormons or whatever, who want, you know, families, like that's bizarro world. And why would anyone want that? So I think there's a weird double standard there. So bizarre. It, yeah, no, I think that that's a really good point. Um, all of these are evolved characteristics. It's not like uh, this is it's something is just like popped into our minds or, or, or it's just like fundamentally obvious without it being obvious within a context that is evolved. I mean, all of these things are downstream of, of our evolutionary conditioning and even novelty. I mean, I think that our capacity to adapt is is also something I've been thinking a lot about. Like, what is it to adapt to all the novelty that we have kind of constantly moving into our environment. And I mean, the, the, even, even thinking about the internet, like the internet is not a static thing. Like the internet of 2008 was very different than the internet of today. And the internet of 2030 is going to be different than the internet of 2021. So we're, we're spending more time in an environment that has no real kind of fundamental nature. And every day, more and more things are being produced on it and it's constantly changing. And so it, it almost seems like we're being, we're really being tested by the things that we've created and the qualities of those creations to really uh, adapt to the, for adaptation itself to become like the kind of center of how we conceive of ourselves uh, surviving in this environment. Um, so adaptation is this is this quality that becomes like necessary to even as an abstraction or as a value or something like that um, that maybe wasn't so obvious in the past. Yeah, and to me the scary thing is that we're we're running hundreds of massive global scale experiments in how does human nature interface with new technologies, and we're running them all in parallel. None of them are siloed or contained. It's not like we can pick one country and ask the question, hey, what are the long-term effects of, of massive free porn use on mating? Let's let that country try it for 50 years and see what happens. <laughs> or what's, what's the uh, implications of Instagram use for one, young women's self-esteem and body image? Let's mm -hmm. run that experiment in one country for 50 years, see what happens. No, instead... We're running them all in parallel with no good outcome metrics. And yeah. it's extremely hard to figure out if things are getting better or worse, what is that uh what does that do to? Um so that's the kind of thing that, that worries me that like even if yoga addiction or porn addiction proves not to be an existential threat to humanity. Mm -hmm there might be something we invent technologically that has social or mating implications that does have actually global catastrophic effects. And, and for that reason, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a um, cautious kind of conservative about a lot of these, these technologies. Like I, I would be happy if the rate of technological innovation in a lot of these spaces was cut by about 90%, mm -hmm. you know, and we're just like, let's just see if we can adapt to the internet as it is today for like 10 or 20 generations and see what happens. 
Sure. And, and if it's okay, then, you know, maybe we can go to the next step, virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever it is, AI. Yeah, but it's hard to pump the brakes on these things. Yeah. But one interesting thing, though, is like those who have children will be the ones who populate the earth. And right now it seems like kind of religiousness and, um, you know, different types of traits than the ones that are uh, common in the kind of coastal elite cities are the people who are going to bring about the future generations. So it could be that we're in this kind of moment, you know, uh, where all of these things are accelerating, but that eventually this kind of, we got to return more to a, uh, maybe a more traditionalist planet when we think about the long-term trajectories of, of birth rates. Uh, what do you, what do you think about, um, what, you know, it's going to look like in a hundred years on the planet if if the birth rates continue the way that they're going, um, and will the civilizations that we live in today be like? Will the values and the ways of life be persistent? I mean, since mating systems are so critical for these over, you know, these downstream kind of effects of political and social organization, will we have the same kind of liberal values? Um, obviously, extrapolation, but uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think in the, in the long term, you know, evolutionary equilibrium is you're, you're going to end up with some kind of global culture that's relatively uh, pronatalist and that values kids just because that the selection effect will be the people who, who you know, value kids will have kids and um, contraception will become sufficiently widely available that it'll become increasingly a conscious uh, choice. Yeah. And uh, this has been salient to me the, the whole time I was I was growing up because uh, my grandfather was um, he was not Mormon but in World War II he was posted to uh, Salt Lake City for a while and got very familiar with sort of, sort of Mormon family values and got very inspired by them and ended up having twelve kids so I have like thirty first cousins and you know big family and I meet other people who come from very small families and. The differences in reproductive rates are just extremely salient to me. And that is going to have uh, long-term effects, all else being equal, because we know, you know, interest in having kids, interest in religion, uh, pronatalist values are to some degree heritable. So you know, I could easily see the earth in sort of 500 years being dominated by people who uh, have much more of a kind of religious, uh, almost uh, fertility fetish. And that the current kind of coastal elites are just nowhere to be found. You know, yeah. runaway careerism and credentialism is not a viable uh, reproductive strategy in the long term. Sure. Great. I think I'm going to turn over to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, this is from Carla. How might the implications on experience functionality of marriage have changed changed as a result of the dramatic increase in life expectancy in Western society and also the criminalization of rape within marriage only in the early 1990s in the UK? Excellent. Yeah, I think like adult lifespans haven't increased as much you know, over the last century, as we think, basically infant mortality has dropped hugely. And so average life expectancy is, has increased a lot because fewer babies and kids are dying really, really young. Um, you do have a kind of um, squaring of the curve where like a lot more people are living into their, their 60s, 70s, and 80s, whereas maybe 100 years ago, there was sort of more of a, a gradual decline where like there's half as many people in their 50s as in, in age 20. So, yeah, marriages to some degree are lasting longer because people are living longer. And hopefully we'll get regenerative medicine and longevity treatments and therapeutics soon that mean uh, maybe my generation won't have to die, or at least Raven's generation won't have to die. We'll see. Uh, and that will have very interesting implications. Is lifelong marriage viable if you can expect to have a two or 300 year lifespan? I don't know. I can't imagine 
people having anything other than kind of serial monogamy or open relationships or something given extremely long lifespans. Uh, science fiction Robert Heinlein, uh, science fiction writer Robert Heinlein was writing about this even in the 1960s. Mm. Um, in terms of marital rape, yeah, gradually over the last few decades, uh, sexual coercion within marriage has become illegal in um, an increasing number of, of countries. And that's very important for you know, women's rights and empowerment and for the, the sort of balance of power within marriages. And I think that's sort of an, uh, an under-celebrated um, triumph of global feminism. You know, that, that for, for billions of women worldwide has been one of the most significant um, advances in women's rights that you can say no, even if you said yes to marriage. Mm -hmm. Totally. Cool, I'll move on to the next question. This is from Patricia. Okay, uh, from, your, uh, from your perspective as an evolutionary psychologist, what social structures do you feel are needed best for us in the areas of pair bonding, child rearing, caring for our elders? As we rethink the structures our parents followed, which pieces still serve us for our personal well-being and for accomplishing the jobs of society? I, I don't have like a complete policy about this, but I think this is one of the most important questions we should be asking in society. Because look, we know from positive psychology, from studies of happiness and well-being, that the quality of your primary sexual relationship is extremely important to overall life satisfaction. And relations with partner and kids are, you know, for many people, far more important than kind of your work satisfaction in some career or how much money you make, you know, uh, if you're in an unhappy marriage, you're unhappy, no matter what else is going right. So I already mentioned the housing issues. I think there's also an issue about um, educational credentialism delaying people from finding mates. And I wrote uh, a book called Spent that was kind of about runaway consumerism but it also touched on runaway careerism and status seeking and runaway credentialism, trying to get you know, college degrees and higher education degrees and so forth. I think what's happened is my industry, higher education, has succeeded in you know, sucking hundreds of thousands of dollars out of every family on, on the basis that we're providing their, you know, their 20 year olds with crucial life skills and education and the, the ticket to a successful career. And I think that's basically only true because there, there are certain sets of like employment expectations that are more or less arbitrary. And it, it's kind of a racket. It's a racket for most college students. Um, many state universities, um, you know, the six-year graduation rate is under 50%. That means for every 10,000 freshmen we take in, fewer than 5,000 will graduate even within six years. But they'll have tens of thousands of dollars of debt. And they've delayed forming a, uh, not just delayed forming a, a family, but delayed starting their work career. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of vocational education, minimal credentials, better job interviews, and, and the idea that you need a BA to, to be interviewed for like entry-level jobs in most industries to me is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if I quite answered your question, but it, it's a good one. And there's a lot more that could be said about that. Absolutely. Okay. And then the final cue from the chat. Okay. So this is kind of building on this idea from, uh, we were talking about pornography. Uh, so you don't think that the precipitous rise of virginity for males under 30 is due to pornography. What do you think the reason is? That's a question from Eric. I think the increase in porn use is more a, a downstream of young men not being able to find mates uh, as young as they'd like. Um, in global perspective, for example, I've gotten quite interested in kind of the mating market in China because I'm looking at doing some research there. 
And the rates of virginity for young men and women in China are also extremely high and increasing rapidly. But porn is completely illegal there. You know, I'm sure they can access it through VPNs, but it's not nearly as common. So I think something else is going on there with um, the, the mating dynamics. I think it has a lot to do with, at least in China, it's a lot to do with kids being incredibly overscheduled and basically spending their entire teenage years you know, studying incredibly hard for the Gaokao, the university entrance exams, and having literally no time for social development, boyfriends, girlfriends, extracurricular activities, athletics, nothing else. Um, what's happening in the US or, or UK, I don't really have a clear idea, but I think it's a lot to do with the fact that young men, at, at least the students in my human sexuality classes, are absolutely terrified to go on dates, to be accused of sexual harassment, to be falsely accused of sexual coercion. There's a kind of um, pervasive fear, right? That's, that's, it's kind of a side effect of, you know, a, a good campaign to raise awareness about date rape and you know, to try to increase colleges taking sexual coercion seriously and trying to reduce it. But a side effect of that is the systems that are in place to kind of adjudicate those cases are not very good. And there's a lot of um, false accusations and there's a lot of young men whose lives kind of get ruined by these things. Um, just as a lot of young women have lives ruined by experiencing sexual coercion. And so that's a huge deterrent. And nowadays, it's not just in college. You get the same kind of culture of uh, sex negativity in corporate America mm -hmm. or corporate Britain. So co-workers are terrified to date each other. And companies are no longer a mating market the way that they were 20, 30 years ago, where you could like plausibly meet you know, a spouse at work. It's really hard to do that. I think whatever I said probably accounts for no more than 15% of the effect though. So there's probably a lot of other factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a final question from Max. Uh, what do you think about the place of feminism today and where do you think would be a use, where do you think it would be useful for it to move towards to? So Raven, you did a fascinating interview on uh, reactionary feminism recently okay. and there's also a branch of Darwinian feminism, which mm -hmm. is evolutionary psychologists, anthropologists, and biologists who are feminists in the, in the kind of classical liberal sense of being very strong advocates for women's rights and equal opportunities, but doing so from an evolutionarily informed view uh, rather than a blank slate view. So I think, you know, the kind of feminist that my mom was uh, you know, she was in League of Women Voters, was in National Organization of Women, you know, advocated for contraception and abortion rights, but acknowledged sex differences and didn't have to pretend and, you know, to believe in a blank slate or gender feminist theories that gender is socially constructed. Um, there's so many varieties of feminism that are, I think, better and more constructive than what's usually labeled feminism. In, in academia. And I hope that those other varieties of feminism can kind of be rediscovered and better integrated into, into mainstream media and discourse. Mm -hmm. Great, cool. And then uh, do you have any advice for the young people? <laughs> Try to make them find families and solve a little, little nugget of wisdom uh, you wanna leave us with? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do think my mate book is really pretty good. I think it oh, still okay. stands <laughs> up. I think six years later, it still stands up. And, you know, my co-author and I, um, Tucker Max and I did a, also 200 episodes of our um, Mating Grounds podcast. that was all about giving dating and life advice to young, single, straight guys, uh, mm -hmm. seeking mates and seeking success. And that's still up on all the podcast um, platforms. I think learning evolutionary psychology is great. 
there's so many good, you know, pop science books out there that, that cover it. There's a lot of YouTube channels that cover it. And um, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, I think it's, I think now more than ever, it's really important to be extremely creative and open-minded about your financial future and to pay attention to um, new opportunities uh, like, you know, what Rebel Wisdom is doing or what people are doing on Substack or new ways of working or new ways of investing. Um, I think that the traditional view that you can just throw money into an index tracking stock fund and hope for the best and expect to retire is not going to be viable very long. And I think now more than ever, young people have to start thinking seriously about, um, you know, what's the long-term future of the American or British or European economy. They have to think about geopolitics. Should I move to China? Should I move to India? Um, should I at least get familiar with the rise in global superpowers that aren't the U S or the UK? Um, what kind of skills should I develop that are relatively um, safe from automation? Yeah. That's an incredibly, like when my students ask, okay, what job can I do that won't be replaced by a robot in 20 years? I have no idea, but I think it's important to think about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, in short, yeah, buy crypto, move to China, find a mate, have babies. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for bringing your perspective here today. It was quite a pleasure to get at all these very fascinating questions with you and have your uh, perspective informing how we're thinking about this here at Rebel Wisdom. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Jeffrey. And thanks to everybody for showing up. Hey. <laughs> have a good day or evening. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.